Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Dan Maybe Project. Uh, this episode is with Connor Miller. <clears throat> Connor is uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a he's a former baseball player and is still got got some passion about it there. I, I think it's it's still underlying. Um, this was a really really good conversation. This is really what uh, you know I sought out to do this podcast and and really what what this is all about you know it's about um, finding new creators and learning more about what motivates them and you know just um, trying to build relationships with people I think Connor has a has an incredible heart and is is really passionate you know he's still he's still a young guy he's a couple years younger than me but he's he's been through a lot seen a lot and uh, gone through some struggles and I think you know that only makes you a better person in the end so he is starting he started his own podcast already and he's kind of building a brand around the podcast and it's it's going to be a clothing brand it's going to be a lifestyle deal it's it's really all all over the place um he's he's got some really good things in store and he's he's doing it right you know he's he's not trying to just grab your attention and and bring you in for a one-time deal he's trying to establish a relationship between customers and and put out a great product and um and he's he's also planning on donating 50 percent of his profits to a charity um i think a lot of it revolves around mental health and different charities that support mental health and mental health research and that type of deal which is uh, something that I think we can all get behind. So, um, yeah, we, we really start out talking about Connor's baseball career. Uh, he was a pitcher and, you know, kind of the struggles that he went through and um, what what led him to start this podcast and, and start this clothing line. And, um, again, you know, some of the, the trials that he went through to get to the point that he is at now, um, I believe in Connor. Um, I, you know, like I said, like I say in the beginning of this, I kind of got caught up in the whole Judge Butch book by its cover, and I didn't really know that this this guy was was serious about what he's doing. But he is, and he's super passionate about it. And I honestly wish the best of luck for him, and I really hope that I can collaborate with him in some way in the future, and that we can uh, help each other out. So. Y'all be sure to follow him on Instagram uh, at Connor Miller seventeen thirty eight. Follow the brand uh, Season Shop. Yeah, S Z N D S H O P. Um, I'll leave some Twitter links and that type of deal down in the description as well. Um, if you want to support this podcast, the easiest way to do that is subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share this. YouTube video on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever your preferred social media platform is. Um, I got stickers in my logo. If you want them, hit me up on Instagram at dan.mabry. Um, and I got a Patreon page and, you know, my Venmo is always open. So um, I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I did and looking forward to the next one. Peace. Connor Miller. How's it going? Uh, Connor, you're an interesting cat. I uh, So I guess you started following me after me and Asia Jordan's podcast. And I'll be straight up with you. I just thought you were some, some Jack Tan kid. Uh, and But I mean, you know, I'm really bad about that. Just like judging people by what I see mm-hmm. first firsthand. Um, and even up until, you know, I, I guess I saw you... Running around in Florida doing some baseball stuff, yeah. and um, but then 
we talked a couple of days ago, I guess maybe a week ago or so, and you said that you would you'd be interested in coming on. Mm-hmm. And initially, I was like, "All right, whatever." I've gotten that before from people. Yeah. But then, like, I looked you up. Uh, you, I guess like the next day, you posted a podcast. Yeah. And uh, you know, I had seen you posting some stuff on your Instagram, and you were clearly working towards something and trying to build something up and um, keeping that kind of low key and as trying. to what what it was. Uh-huh. And uh, so I had to look you up and, and see what was going on with you. And then I saw, I literally Googled your name because I couldn't mm-hmm. find you on Facebook yeah. and Googled your name and ULM pops up okay. and I was like, oh, all right. So then I, I asked you like, where are you from? Where did you go to high school? And mm-hmm. you said Pineville, Tyga. And I was like, all right. Or you didn't say Tyga, but I found that mm-hmm. out. Um, That's cool. So I guess I want to start out kind of telling your story and then we'll get into some of what you've been doing on the creative side. All right. Um, so when did you when did you pick up baseball? Like, was that an early thing? Yeah, I started baseball real early. That's kind of uh, the reason it kind of built me on everything that I do, sort yeah. of. So I started baseball probably like four or five years old. Yeah, playing t-ball and yeah, that kind of Yeah, t-ball and all that. Never really took it serious. Honestly, I was just like, I was kind of fat when I was younger. So, like, I was just like this big kid who could hit the ball kind of far just from being a chunky and stuff. Yeah. Then, you know. Baseball, I get a little bit better. I get a little bit leaner stuff, you know. Yeah, grow it, grow into it. Still kind of chunky. And uh, <laughs> while I'm playing baseball, actually, um, I don't know if you found this out, but I was a Team USA cup stacker. Okay. Did you see that? I did not. So I was on Team USA at a like cup eight years old. So I was like on yeah. the legit, like it was like an Olympic team almost. Is. For sure. Mm-hmm. I remember that in, uh, in elementary school yeah. myself. That's how I found out. So like third, second, maybe even first grade, we started like doing that. And I didn't take it serious, but I kind of did, sort of. I just did it all day. Yeah. Then was that when you like, or were you, you think you were already competitive at that point? I was, or is I was that, a very, I was competitive at weird stuff. I wasn't competitive. Honestly, at baseball, I was kind of like this passive kid. Yeah. But like cup stack and I would get like real angry whenever somebody was like better than me. So I just, I cup stack like literally eight hours a day, probably. Wow. It was more important to me than baseball, but I was better at baseball than cup stacking at first. So it was weird. My coach hated it. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Yeah. So I went into that and. I'm, like, missing, like, baseball tournaments. Like, we had a big baseball team. Like, it was called the Bounty Hunters. Okay. And I was missing tournaments, baseball tournaments, to go to cup stacking tournaments, and, like, everybody was making fun of me. It was so so (laughs) ridiculous now looking back on it. But uh, I was, like, traveling to Houston and stuff for, like, these little tournaments and stuff. There's, like, thousands of people in the, like, the tournaments and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I just went to one random one. Nobody knew my name. And then I was, like, the overall champion is what they call it. So... I don't know, do you, you know, like, the 333 and 360? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm familiar with what you're <laughs> so, talking about. It, like, the overall is, like, you, what the lowest time you can get overall, all of those. So, I was overall champion, and I'm just, like, chilling. During the summer, it was doing nothing like a normal summer kid does, and I get a random phone call. And they're like, we want you on Team USA. So, I was, like, and then I literally threw the phone, and I was jumping <laughs> around. And, like, I almost started crying. It was so cool. But that was, like, my dream kind of, sort of. But I How old were you real. in this? I was, like, eight or nine i think that's wild so i was like in fourth or fifth grade and i was that kid who walked around with cups on his um belt loop yeah i was like and everybody you had like the little mini cups and everything i had the metal (laughs) cups i had every single set you could have back then yeah and i was on team usa probably for like three or four years wow you know the coach basically gave me an ultimatum but like he didn't really sort he's just like you know you got to pick yeah and eventually as i got better at baseball i kind of decided you know i'm getting a little too old for cup second for sure so. so um when did when did you become a pitcher? When did you start pitching? I guess uh, I was always fascinated with a guy named Mariano Rivera with the Yankees and For stuff. Sure. And what you see as a kid, like you kind of try to mimic, sort of. So that's how I did everything. Was and I thought about Mariano Rivera with everything, and he's in the Hall of Fame and stuff now. So that's yeah. pretty cool looking back on it. But I tried to like mimic him and everything, and he was a pitcher, so I wanted to be a pitcher. So shoot, from the first time I could pitch at nine years old, I always wanted to pitch. I was a better hitter than I was a pitcher though, so because I was. I was a little bit too chunky to be throwing a ball. I don't know. It was a little. It looked, it looked weird. <laughs> yeah. So I get that though. I I, uh, I played baseball for basically t ball through seventh or eighth grade. Uh, Chipper Jones was my guy. You know, I was mm-hmm. wearing number ten. I wore my socks high. I wanted to play third base. That kind that's, of deal. That's how it goes. A lot of people you, you usually mimic who you you like and stuff. It's cool. Yeah, for sure. So I guess. You 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 start pitching. Mm-hmm. You know, did you you get into high school? Um, was it or middle school or so, did you ever play like travel ball or anything yeah, so like that? I played travel ball. I think I started at nine years old. 
I played travel ball up until high school. I didn't play any junior high ball. I just it was just straight travel ball because like it kind of interfered with junior high. So we just did straight travel ball and stuff, and basically until fourteen. So okay, it was pretty fun. But yeah, nah, I wish I could could have played junior high. It would have been it would been kind of cool to play for an actual school back then. Yeah, y'all had like Tioga Middle School or something. Mm-hmm, Tioga junior high. Uh, and y'all had a team at the school. There were the travel team. No, like oh, yeah, there was a team at the school, but like. And, like, the whole entire travel ball team kind of went to that high school, but nobody played on it. So, it was, like, uh, they were still good players, but, like, we weren't on the team, too. So, they kind of, like, were, the coaches yeah. there were kind of, like, you know, y'all should at least come play. Cause, uh, so, I grew up in West Monroe, mm-hmm. and I went to Good Hope Middle School, and we did not have a baseball team. There was a baseball team that was started, and they wore Good Hope's name, and, uh-huh. like, all the kids went to Good Hope. But they weren't associated with the school. It was a really sketchy kind of deal. Yeah. But, uh that's kind of Western row athletics for you, I guess. <laughs> Always trying to be the best. So but you went to good hope. You're in. Yeah. Went to good I hope know, middle school. Heard of it. It was in, just in West Monroe. It's like uh, a small school. Not like, so there's West Monroe high school mm-hmm. and there's three middle schools that feed into West Monroe high school. Uh, good hope, middle riser, middle and Westridge. And, you know, other than that, you know, you have the transfer of people in or whatever that come around randomly. Yeah. Um, but so I guess when, I guess, when did you start to see like you were going to be a pitcher? Like you were, that was what you were wanted to do. Uh, or that was your preferred yeah. position, I guess. Probably sophomore year of high school. Freshman year, I liked, like that was the only thing, like whenever you're a varsity, playing varsity on our high school team was kind of like the cool thing. Like if you're a freshman playing varsity, and that's the first time I ever got playing time was as a pitcher. So that's kind of when I decided, you know, I'm a better pitcher than hitter. Right. So from fresh, right in freshman year when I got the first, like, inning in and varsity, I was like, you know, this is this is my main focus, sort of. Yeah. So I guess was uh, was Tioga any good in baseball? Yeah, we were like uh, – our only two state championships were in uh, 88 and 89. But, like, we were always, like, in the running, but we never actually, like, got that tip-top, you know, state championship, yeah. sort of. And – uh. Y'all are four A. Four A. Okay. And uh, it was they just won a state championship last year. Actually, the first one since then. Wow. So that's kind of cool. But we also made it to semifinals, and that was like a big milestone because yeah. we haven't been to the semifinals since '89. But like, our, my four years were probably like the best four years Tioga's had in a long time until the people now since they won. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were pretty like we were the best, definitely like the best team in like that central Louisiana area. Like there was Ash and all, you, you know, Ash for sure. And, Ash and Pablo, they were pretty good, but like we usually like were the team that kind of won every central Louisiana battle, sort of. Okay, was, fair enough. Yeah, I played soccer, and oh, so right. we would play Ash, and Ash of course, had a pretty good soccer team. Huh? Yeah, they yeah. did. They we did not, and they, <laughs> they beat us most times. Uh, of course, we played Pineville in every sport. Mm-hmm. They were in our district. Yeah. Um, I was a kicker on the football team. My longest field goal was against Pineville oh, at, really? at their That's field. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a weird story, but uh, I try. I actually tried out for the soccer team at Tioga. Yeah, didn't make it. <laughs> it's good. Good yeah. conditioning for I sure. I try. I went to the trial. He's like, "Are you being for real?" I'm like, "I'm trying, man." He's, <laughs> oh, all right, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I think you should just stick to baseball. Like, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, I guess. Did you get a scholarship to ULM? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think I got offered the scholarship sophomore year. I think like I was um, I think I just finished uh, like a showcase, and then I was like taking a shower or something. I, I usually answer the phone in the shower as a joke and stuff. Just like they hear the water run, I just like I'll call you back. <laughs> yeah, and I answer and it's like the ULM coach, and I'm like, oh, uh, one second. Was that Coach Shake Snyder? No, that was uh Petty. Whenever he okay, was, that he called me. All right, All right. but. He's not there anymore. So, yeah. So, you know, bad stuff happened with that. Yeah. You know. Um. So, at that point, were you were you throwing the 90s in junior, senior year? Uh, okay. So, I, when I committed, I was an average pitcher, probably 83 to 86. Did you commit sophomore year? I committed verbally, I think, sophomore year. Okay. I believe. Either that or early junior year. Because I remember when I did it, my coach, I, like, usually you're supposed to tell your coach, and your high school coach, you know, like, hey, I'm about to do this. And like, so they can be ready for like when they get interviewed. And he's like, I just got interviewed. I didn't even know what you were doing. So it was kind of funny. I just randomly one night just announced it on Twitter. I was like, I'm committing to ULM. And my parents didn't even know it. I just committed. And it was funny. So did you get any more buzz from any schools like the next couple of years? 
I pretty much usually like when you commit, like if you once you sign it, you're you're like no right. I talk to you obviously, but once I verbally committed sophomore year, I think that kind of just like turned people off because I they probably thought I was dead set on it since I committed so soon. Yeah, and I was more of a I wasn't really a good, like a stat guy sort of. I was more like I was a good like batting cage hitter. I was a good bullpen pitcher, but when I got in the game, like I couldn't throw strikes stuff like that. I had the stuff, but I could never like bring it to a game so he they were kind of betting on me to sort of come to college and learn how to pitch sort of so that's why like gotcha. a lot of colleges didn't want to like mess with me because they wanted a pitcher that could throw strikes and do what i already did so yeah it was hard to mess with me a little bit yeah um so i mean did, did they ever like tell you that they were like hey we like what you like you we like your potential mm-hmm. or something like the, the funny thing is the only two games i think they ever came to watch me at one of them was a no hitter and the other one was like a good six inning outing that like I only think they knew kind of sort of that was like a bad pitcher sort of <laughs> it was kind of funny the only two games they ever came to and I, I like saw them at was those two games and I was just doing really well those two games that's weird yeah, that was crazy uh had you ever like visited Monroe or ULM yeah uh, that's like where all my family was from that's okay the reason I picked it my grandparents and like a lot of my family's over there gotcha uh so you end up at ULM and did you pitch? You pitched freshman year? So my freshman year, I had arm pain my entire life. I don't know, like, if you know about injuries and stuff. I always was hurting yeah. and stuff. And so the entire fall, I was kind of shut down, sort of. I was always in the training room just getting work done on my arm and stuff. And then, like, over, like, winter break, I go and, like, train at, like, uh, driveline in Washington. And, you know, I was feeling, like, really good. Like, I was the best pitcher I've probably ever been going into, like, the next season. And it was the last scrimmage inner squad like so we had like teams and we were mm-hmm. doing that it was the last scrimmage and i was just like that was like my best outing of the like the um spring going so far and then all of a sudden just one pitch bop i feel like i popped my elbow sort of like i just feel like all of a sudden it gave out and then you know tommy john yeah i've i've so i've had a little bit of time to watch some of your videos mm-hmm. and i think you said like i threw a pitch and I kind of felt something, some pain, and it kind of felt weird. And then you threw another one, and you were like, oh, man, this is not good. And you pulled yourself. Mm-hmm. I guess I didn't realize it was, like, inner squad. Yeah, it was, like, the last one. Like, the next weekend, we were going to Dallas Baptist to play, and I just didn't get – oh, I went, but it just sucked because, you know, I was just – I already knew I pretty much tore it, so it was just watching. Yeah. So, at that point, had you, like, gone to the doctor? Or? Uh, I went to have the MRI done, but I hadn't got the results yet. But I – he was pretty sure, you know. Yeah, so you were just working. you were just hanging with the yeah. team at that point. Um, Most miserable year of my life. So I guess, and that's that's really where I'm curious as to like where your mind was at, because obviously, like you had you like you said you had some potential, mm-hmm. but I mean, I, and I'm not saying uh, I don't know you you hit this this gigantic wall, and I mean obviously you hear people like go and have Tommy John and, and recover and recover better. Mm-hmm. Like you hear those stories. Um, but I guess what, what was your motivation to, to keep going? Like, I mean, I, I'd kind of talk crap about ULM sometimes. They're yeah. like, ULM's not like the biggest school in the world. Like mm-hmm. they're probably not going to make a run for the college world series. Yeah. Um, so I guess like what, what was like, man, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep pursuing this baseball thing. That was, like, the first time probably in my life I ever, like, bet on myself, sort of. So, that's when I dropped out was after, like, that season. So, the season ends, we had probably, like, a record losing season. I'm, like, you know, I kind of, like, checked my worth a little bit. I felt like I was better than – not better than, like, them as a school, but I, I just felt like I could could be a better, like, overall person and stuff. Yeah. So, I dropped out. Parents weren't happy about that. You like, know? you stayed the rest of the school I, year? I stayed the rest of the school year. I Hated my life, the whole, like, baseball thing. Like, I like the dudes on the team, but just as, like, a whole, it really left a bad taste in my mouth being there. Yeah. But every time I think about that, like, I just, like, think of only bad moments at ULM. I don't think of, I can't think of one good, good moment I had there. Yeah. Like, but, I'm trying to think of, really, the thought process. So, I decided to drop out probably, I think, July of that summer. So, you know, the... The, they, that's when they were switching head coaches. So the head, new head coach calls me. He's like, hey, Connor, you know you plan on coming back? And I'm like, I don't know. Give me a few days. So I just sat and thought about it, and I was like, I think I can do better. So I decided to take a gap year. And uh, 
parents like you know kept on saying you know give it another week you might want to come back and i'm like no i don't want to go back there ever again and so like july whatever you're you're starting to recover you're starting to rebuild mm -hmm. a little bit like are you you're starting to you're in the gym working out yeah so uh right around that time i was uh, i think in august that's when i moved to florida just for like a month to train so i was at the florida baseball ranch and that's where i, I did like a lot of my rehab process was there okay but that was like the first time in my life I ever like gave my all to something sort of. So like all my life I kind of took baseball half serious, but I was good. So it just kind of worked out and I had like some physical gifts sort of. Yeah. That was the first time I really like went all in for that year of rehab. And like I kind of made it like my entire life sort of. But that was like the first time I went through like depression in my life probably. Yeah. Sort of like ULM I had a bad time, but I never went through depression. Right. And like questioning like my self-worth. But, like, whenever your only goal every day is to train for baseball and, you know, you have one bad day, you question everything, sort of. And that's, like, what I was going through. Well, and, like, I guess that's kind of where my, my question was earlier. Like, you're, like, you're not you, – you are training to become a pitcher mm -hmm. and you, you don't have anywhere to go pitch. Yeah. Like, you're not, you're not playing games. Like, you're not – I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you're getting reps, but uh, they did that – I can see why you would, why that would lead you down that path, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, like, that was also a thing that a motivation, like, you know, I have nowhere to go, so I literally have to go as hard as I can. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I did. I was, um, usually like whenever you're a year out is whenever, you know, you're, you're getting close back. And when I was a year out, I was better than I was a year ago. So I, I went all in on something finally and it was finally working out. And then, you know, another injury came so okay so but yeah obviously you like your parents were supportive mm -hmm. that whole time yeah the whole time they were you know they were they were supportive but they're also you know a realist too they're yeah. like you know connor you're you, you you're saying what you want to do but like you're you know there's a chance that it doesn't happen mm -hmm. and you know people say college is the only way and stuff and i don't know i don't i, I changed my mind on college probably around that time i was like you know college isn't needed in certain aspects and every anything i wanted to do college wasn't really a good option yeah um i guess talk about these these ranches these baseball mm -hmm. you got one in you said one in florida one in texas one in washington mm -hmm. washington state oh uh, well, yeah washington uh I'm trying to think kent washington okay yeah. but uh, the one in washington is in a ranch it's called just like drive line baseball it's like just a train facility but there's a ranch in texas and florida i've been to both of those florida one's like more on rehab texas one's more on like performance Sort of, but they do the same things. But I found out about them just they take in a lot of people who are hurt and help them get better and stuff, give them plans. So that's how I found them, and they were like the coolest group of people I've ever met, probably. So is it like uh, like indoor facilities? You got baseball fields, you it, got training rooms. That's exactly how it sounds. It's, it's a they make it look kind of crappy on purpose because it's called the ranch. Like yeah. They don't. They could. Live, they have enough money, obviously, to upgrade everything, but they like keeping in that like. It's like a dungeon type feeling. Yeah. So it's exa it looks exactly like a ranch, like a lot of open land and then just one big tin building. It's okay. pretty cool. But yeah, Texas and Florida Ranch both look pretty identical. They're both based off the same principles, sort of. Gotcha. So it's just a training facility. It's not Basically necessarily... Basically, it's a big training facility that they take in a lot of pro guys, a lot of um, people who are just hurt. But a lot of people travel. Like one time, I think a dude came in from like China. I, when I was there this summer, he came in from China to train just for a week and then he left. I was like, okay. Yeah, it's crazy. They bring in people all over the world. So, at some well, at some point, you decided to go back to college, and is that when you came to Tech? Yeah. So this is around the time I was kind of um, not giving up on baseball, but I was being realistic because over the, like this that summer, whenever I got fully rehabbed, I was back up to uh, ninety three or so, ninety four, and I was feeling really good. All of a sudden, I just I was deadlifting. All of a sudden, I felt like a weird tweak in my back. So then I was like, oh, I don't know how this feels. So like my leg was like in pain 24 seven, like radiating pain down. So I was like hindering like any type of baseball training cause I would just hate my life during it sort of. And um, that's when I decided to have a back surgery and it just never really got like where I was sort of. And I'm never a person that wants to do something kind of like half ass sort of. I just want to be full in and I couldn't be full in on that was that pain. Yeah. I just hated my life training every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was another thing that like grabbed my attention about your videos and stuff is 
you have this nice training facility at your house, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you you kind of led into it earlier. Uh, you you go to these ranches, and and I guess you learned a bunch of techniques and warm up routines and resistant bands workouts mm-hmm. and, and rolling out your arms and stuff. And I was, um, I, I was mean, you were like doing dude, some yeah. wild stuff in those videos, dude, throwing balls against the wall, like throwing it backwards and yeah, stuff. I was like always the dude who like everybody went to for like knowledge on like any type of like physical training and like baseball stuff. So that's when I always like, I was always able to give to people sort of from that. So even though the baseball didn't work out, I liked that. I'm still able to help people. Yeah. Sort of. But did you learn that stuff at those ranches or is that something that you a little bit of both? I was always looking up stuff. Okay. It's probably starting like senior year was like when I first like really started researching everything I could. That's when I learned how to train all that. Yeah. Cause it looked like you were able to like get super technical with your, your recovery and mm-hmm. your, your trying to regain strength and everything after Tommy John. Yeah. That's something I, uh, I try to be really experimental with stuff. I, I'd rather, like, I'd like to use myself as an experiment sort of. So I try a bunch of like weird stuff. So I didn't, I don't follow like, just one like protocol sort of, I just take everything that I've learned from all the places I've ever been and then also my own stuff and try to create just custom. Talk to me about weighted balls. Mm-hmm. I, I so. that, that was a topic that you had to yeah. got asked about. Uh, and it seems it may be a little controversial. Yeah. So, so it, is it like the double bat thing? Like the, the donut bat thing? Like you, you what? swing enough with it, it makes it feel lighter. Do you like do you did you play baseball in here? Yeah, no? you yeah. did. Okay, so like weighted balls are like they're not needed, but if you can, some people want to get results, but they don't want to like take any chances with it. If you want to throw a ball 100 miles per hour, you have to take some type of risk because of getting hurt. Yeah. So with weighted balls, if you're you can throw them. It's just if you're hurting and stuff, don't throw them. That's kind of how it works. It's not like yeah. some people think you because you throw weighted balls, you start hurting. If you throw them like wrong, like if you go in the gym and you lift wrong, you're gonna get hurt. If you right. go and throw weighted balls wrong, you're gonna get hurt. They tell you like to not like ego lift in the gym. You shouldn't ego throw with weighted balls. Sort of. It's not, yeah. Not supposed. That's not how it's supposed to go. Sort of. That's why it's got a bad rep because you got a bunch of guys who see you're supposed to throw the heaviest ball possible as hard as you can, and then they go throw it and they tear their UCL, they tear a labrum, and they're like. So ball's fault. you're like going full road, full motion, full rotation. Yeah. It depends on the ball, the day, you know, yeah. some days you have a recovery day, some days a velo day. It's just depends on that. Uh, there's like, there's a big black ball. It's like two pounds or four pounds. And then all the way down to a gray ball. It's like a pound or it's just like, you, it's like a pebble throwing. It's crazy. Yeah. But you're just like, you were just throwing it against that wall or whatever. Mm-hmm. So like you do, you, know, you like throw like it's called reverse throw or you do like pivot picks and you just do all types of sort of things that like help you throw a ball more efficiently. Okay. That's fair. That's, kind of, that's, the, that's the main goal of like a weighted ball. So when you throw it, like it makes you be the most efficient that you possibly can to like move it. So like your body kind of automatically does it for you. It like lets go of all the thought process. It just moves. Okay. That's kind of the reason for like weighted balls and stuff. Okay. Uh, I guess what your, your, your back injury, mm-hmm. like, do you think that was, was that just kind of like a fluke thing or do you think that was like bad form or? I, I, think, mean, I think it's a combination. My, my grand, like my mom's side of the family has a real history of like bad bones and stuff and bad backs. And I think it's kind of a little bit of genetics and a little bit of how stupid I was early in life. Of yeah. Like lifting. I for squatted sure. every day for 90 days straight, like heavy squatting. Wow. I would like max out on pretty much max out almost every day pretty much like I would hit like a three rep max on either a back or a front squat every day for 90 days and by the end of it talking like my, about squat-tober yeah that, that's that's when it started October 1st and I went up until about January wow so it by the end of it though that's whenever um I first had any type of back pain and it's kind of how my back probably started getting hurt sort of it probably started like a long time ago probably in like 2015 2016 then by 2019 it was done so i guess you haven't like completely given up on baseball because you went back to the ranch this summer well it, or was it, that just like an, it, in a I teaching went, manner? i went there to train yeah and i was also the videographer and the uh, social media manager and stuff and about like probably the first month i was still training and stuff and like trying to get back to where i was and I just had to kind of check like where my passion was, and I I think somewhere around a year and a half out, that was when I finally like realized you know I don't like baseball as much as I thought I did, and like I wasn't passionate about it anymore. When I was younger, I would watch baseball all the time, 
And then as I got older, it seemed like I kept on growing out of it, sort of. But that's what everybody kind of did. They stopped watching it, but I really just didn't care about watching it ever. Wow. Yeah, and then, uh, but I still, like, I was really good, so I was like, you know, my heart might not be in it, but I'm really good at it. Yeah. And then, that's when I started Project 95 and stuff, was like, that's where I kind of found, like, I like doing this, and the only way that I can make it in this, I gotta combine them, sort of. And I always just told my mom and stuff, you know, I don't love baseball anymore, but I'm going to, I'm going to make it in there just because I feel like I owe it to them. So you led into it. What is Project Ninety Five? What is baseball and barbells? Uh, Project Ninety Five. I started in senior year of high school. It was a it was a vlog sort of. It was supposed to be around baseball and getting the ninety five miles per hour because I was like ninety two, ninety three, but it just turned into a stupid high school vlog for like a month. Like my last month of high school. So it was fun to look back. It's like really euphoric moments. I'm like. I miss those days, sort of. It's kind, yeah. of. it's kind of fun to look back on. So I'm glad I did it, but they're pretty cringy vlogs. But that's what it started out was. There was no, there was really no baseball training. It was all just hanging out with friends and then baseball playoffs and all that and graduating. So it's fun to look back on those moments. Yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. Then I think when I got to ULM and then I left, I was like, I can revamp it. So like when I went to college, I didn't. I stopped YouTube because like people on the team made fun of me and stuff. But they didn't really make fun of me. Like they were just joking with me, but I kind of took yeah. it serious. I was no, like, you know, I get it. I feel like. I didn't like vlogging in public and it was, it was just cringy sort of. Nah, yeah. dude. And th- that's something that I wanted to bond over with you with because, you know, I've brought my camera in public places plenty of times on plenty of trips. And, and you know, worst. you go with friends who don't care about it at all or mm-hmm. don't want to participate in it or whatever. Yeah, that's hard. And it's like, all right, well, it's a whole lot easier just not to do it mm-hmm. than it is to inconvenience my friends or whatever. That's something like. I think a lot of my friends have gotten used to it, but my girlfriend still hasn't gotten used to it a little bit. She's like, you put your whole life on like social media and stuff. It's kind of like, it's a little weirdly. Like, I don't know like if you're videoing like any second of the day, I could just like do something bad. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's yeah. weird. I don't know. It's like, I guess maybe, uh, obviously I don't know her, but I would say you probably have her best interest in yeah. mind, you know? Uh, that's that's kind of what I try to convey to my friends. You know, I'm not going to... Uh, embarrass you or, or do my yeah. best not to do so uh, yeah, she, people uh, aren't really like used to people like us kind of sort of yeah always like video and stuff and trying to do weird stuff for sure uh, craft. so when when did you pick up a camera when did you when did you get inspired to do that how did that come about it's kind of why i brought up cup stack and that's where i started that was my first youtube videos ever sort of so that's I had like this Sony, just video, normal video camera, but it was really good. Like it was crazy quality for back then. Yeah. I would literally upload probably like a video a week sort of just of me cup stacking. And then all of a sudden I got like a bunch of subscribers to me back then, like probably a couple thousand, but I was like eight years old. So I was like, it's pretty cool. And that's yeah. before you can make money from YouTube. So you just did it for the love of it. Gotcha. So I was uploading there and then, you know, created like this big old community, you know, how like a Reddit community works sort of. It was kind of like that. We had like a big old group chat of all like the YouTube cup stackers. And we were just talking about editing and stuff. We'd make each other like montages and they'd be like tribute videos, like tribute to in their name and yeah. be like a big old montage of all their best stacked times and stuff. Yeah. So that was the first time I ever like had a camera and I ever edited a video and all that stuff. And then probably from like 10 years old to 17, I didn't touch a camera ever again. I didn't even like think about it or YouTube. I just watched YouTube. I didn't care about it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden 17 comes around. I'm going through like my uh, closet my senior year and I'm like, on a camera and then i was like i've been watching vlogs and stuff so i might as well start it so then i downloaded like iMovie. i was like okay i'm gonna start it yeah and then pretty and bad that, at first <laughs> well and uh obviously you you know it you can't mm-hmm. get discouraged by that you know i i am one of those people who fully embraces the fact that you got to fall on your face to figure things out and the first one's gonna suck mm-hmm. and uh you know obviously you can You can, I think, well, for me, I'm kind of someone who uh, doesn't always do the full research before I jump into something. It seems like you are, you're, you are setting things up, especially now, but obviously you've, you've kind of gone through the trials and tribulations to a little bit, Mm -hmm. Um, but we're always, we're always learning and always. That's uh, that's something I've been looking into here lately. So something that's held me back for probably like the last two years from posting consistently on YouTube is. People call it a um, a good attribute, but I think it's negative now. Is perfectionism sort of? Yeah. I want every video perfect, edits perfect, sound perfect, everything. And 
has held me back from like creating sort mm-hmm. of and the they say like the beautiful part is like the imperfections and stuff that's what makes it kind of great is like you put yeah. your whole life out there yeah and i wanted everything to be perfect i wanted to have perfect hair in every shot perfect clothing and i just had to like i'm still working on letting it go sort of yeah to make something not perfect but good enough yeah i gave up on that yeah. <laughs> i uh i'm me and uh you know oh, which a lot of my content is this podcast and it's it's real and raw and I wanted it to be that way from the beginning. And so, uh, you know, I want to show all the blunders and us and mm-hmm. everything else that goes like along that. with it, you know? That's what I love and, about podcasts. That's like, that's, that's why I started the podcast with like the season podcast. I just want to let go of like perfection for a second and post a weekly video of a podcast that just having fun with it and don't have to sit there and edit everything meticulously. Yeah. So I, I didn't get into vlogs until like two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. I was living in Denver, Colorado by myself and uh, just had the internet and my computer. So I would always mm-hmm. get on YouTube and I uh, found this guy named Austin Augie. Okay. He's I'm a there. BMXer oh, okay. and a model. Uh, That's what I think a lot of people don't understand. There's 7 billion people in the world and there's there's a vlogger for every single person. So some people are scared to start YouTube because like, my life isn't interesting, but everybody has their thing. And, like, yeah. I would never heard of that guy because I'm just not like in that genre of YouTube. So yeah, There's a bunch of people that you never even noticed. that have millions of subscribers for sure. But like, uh, I kind of caught him not super early, but like maybe like six months into his YouTube career. Mm-hmm. And he, like I watched maybe vlog 37 or something. And he was like, all right, I'm putting out one every day until I can't. And I like literally watch this dude like develop his own style and get more cinematic with every day. And, you know, then it was like, obviously I've never met this person in person, but like, I feel like I have a relationship with this dude because I was watching him every day and watching him get better and get modeling gigs or do a new trick on the bike or whatever, you know? And, uh, I, but I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like, you you that's maybe the best way to connect with the audience is to see those blunders and to see your failures and you know it's like nobody wants you don't want to like cry to the camera in your bedroom by yourself but like if that's what's if that's what's going on in your life like that's i mean yeah if if you're vlogging every day you know i I think that's kind of the way you have to do it that's what i had uh i'd keep a camera pretty much everywhere i went and like College, I never posted videos, but I would, I would still video. So, like, I kept on, um, like, this little, like, crappy camera in my dash in my truck. And, like, every day, like, that I was down or something, I took it out and just put it on dash and I talked to it. I can't find that footage now because I'm sad about that. I but, was about to say, yeah. like, uh, you know Casey Neistat? Yeah. You know, he he's, like, the king of digging up old footage and working it into that's his what, videos. That's what made me get, like, I got, like, so many hard drives and I would just, I wasn't even posting YouTube videos. I was just videoing. Just yeah. to, like, have it. Yeah, I've been, well, of course, iPhones are, like, killer now, yeah. so I've been starting to try to work that more and just, just build up footage to where whenever I finally start to, I mean, I'm planning on vlogging every yeah. day pretty soon, so. Yeah. People uh, don't appreciate, like, just those, like, little videos and what they can mean to you. Like, they used to appreciate pictures from back in the day, but now it's videos, like, you know, oh, man, I don't remember that moment, and then, like, a year ago, you can get really euphoric about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for watch sure. Watch back on it. I do it all the time. So, um, I guess let's talk about the podcast season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so S S Z N D. Okay. Yeah, season. It's just like, you know, season your food. All right. That's a, uh, where did the, where did the name come from? So I started, uh, I had a clothing brand called Neller. That's why I started. That's okay. why I started. So I it saw, was, saw it on your hoodie in one video. I saw yeah. it on your truck out there. I didn't know what that was. It's, that was my first ever go around it selling clothing so it was cool watching youtubers back in senior year and they had merch so i was like i want my own merch yeah so with my series like in it was kind of like the process of like building neller sort of was also in there because like casey nice always had like a story behind his vlogs my story was like i was creating neller so within that like that month of vlogging for part 95 senior year i started neller i ordered 100 shirts and sold maybe like 20 of them <laughs> then i gave away probably the rest sort of but that's like that was my first go at a clothing line but I wouldn't call it like a real attempt though. I just, I didn't put any thought process into it. I made like a, I made a logo myself and it was really bad looking and stuff and put it on a t-shirt. Didn't, 
care about the fabric. I just ordered it. Yeah. That was my first go around. I didn't know anything about the fashion industry. And I tried another go around, another, I think in college, another half ass effort that I didn't really ever go all in on. You know, I said I was going to do this and that. Never really did it. Then a few months ago, I was talking with my friend and I was trying to figure out I wanted to do Neller again, but I would, I wanted to keep it Neller, but call it something else. And it was going to be like Neller and then the X seasoned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was going to do that. And, uh, I just didn't like Neller anymore. It was, I had it trademarked and I had the, um, LLC and all that, but I was like, I want a complete restart. Cause when you hear Neller and like, you know what it used to be, you kind of get a salty taste in your mouth. You're like something that never really followed through on anything. Man, that's the perfectionist in you. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm going to do this and that. Never happened. I I did one launch that was half-assed, and then a second launch that I don't even think I sold more than 10. There were some people who ordered that I just refunded their money a few months later. They like, they emailed, like, the contact email, and I was just like, here you go, man. Wow. They gave them a few extra dollars. Like, my bad. Dang. Yeah, I just never fulfilled the orders because I just, I was so focused on baseball and stuff, and I just kind of didn't ever go all in. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess you're kind of leading into it, but Mm -hmm. Seasoned is is more than a podcast. It's more than a YouTube channel. It's Mm -hmm. like, it's a whole brand that you're trying to start. I'm trying, I'm trying to do a lot with Seasoned, a lot more than, I don't like calling it clothes, merchandise, apparel. I've I've told that to a lot of people. They're like, they're sick of hearing me say it, but I want to call it art. It's it's like, it's not just. You you mentioned in one of your Instagram videos, like you want to change what fashion is. I'm so sick of like, People like all these like I'm I'm cool with merch, but I'm so sick of seeing all these Instagram ads of clothing that is like complete shit. Yeah, it's not because I've ordered it. I was like, you know, these shirts look really dope, and I ordered it. It's a hundred percent cotton shirt. Mm-hmm. I I wash it. Like I wear it one time. It's, it's kind of dope. I wash it. It like turns into like a baby gap shirt. It's like the sleeves get weird. And yeah. I, I just get pissed and like I wasted thirty dollars on this shirt. Yeah, it's it's worth maybe ten dollars. Mm-hmm. So that's why I decided to start season because I want to create something I'm gonna wear every day, and that's actually a real product. So that's that's the reason for season, and what season stands for is uh, the seasons of life. So going through depression and all that is what kind of taught me that everybody's in a different season. So while I'm depressed, you know, there might be my guy next to me, he might be in the best season of his life, and, you know, you're constantly going through those seasons. It's a constant, like, circular motion. So that's the reason for the arrows around the logo. Okay. And then, like, there's mountains and stuff in it because there's mountains, there's on the valleys, you know, your rivers and stuff like that. So there's all types of seasons and elements to life. So that's the main thing with season and mental health. Mental health became something like really big to me through the Tommy John process, going through rehab, just like going through those depressing moments. And I was like, you know, we got to make this a bigger deal than it really is or than people were making it. So do you mind, you mean you, you mind opening up about that, the d- depression oh, okay. and, and all that? I yeah, mean, uh, so you, you mentioned in one of your videos that you were like, w- at least once a week, like you had, you hit, yeah. you hit a wall of some oh. sort. I was like, I don't even know what, what the name, like I was a, a basket case. That, that's like what I'm looking for. I was a basket case, dude. I was like, one day my arm would feel great. So like whenever you're going through the, the Tommy John process, I still get DMs every day. Like people saying like, my arm feels good this day. Then the next day I'm thinking the world's over. And that's exactly like how I was. I would, one day I'd be coming in the house, like screaming, like, yeah, I'm, I'm about to make it big. I feel great. And then the next day I'm throwing my glove at that wall. I'm like, man, I, I just want to quit. And I was, that was the most I probably ever cried in my life was that year. Like in high school, I don't think I cried more than a few times, maybe at most like over a girl or something. Yeah. But, I was crying over literally a baseball game and not even a game, just like training, just from being in pain. I would just get pissed and cry. And that's why I met my girlfriend. So like, she was like brand new to me and she didn't like know anything about me other than like my persona online. She thought like I was this cool dude who never had any issues. And I would just like open up to her. Like I'm so like depressed. She's like, Oh man, I need to get away from this kid. <laughs> that's uh, that was kind of, um, weird starting out with her sort of going through that process because she got there right in the middle of it yeah so it was kind of the worst sort of yeah that's a weird uh a, initiation of a relationship i'm sure it was definitely weird it was a bad, bad start. <laughs> <laughs> so uh i guess uh you haven't really released a whole lot but can you can you talk about the clothing brand or maybe a little bit so what you i brought this on? out for you just to, yeah for sure uh, i went to austin the other day and i got these are all the fabrics and stuff that are actually going to be at in the first launch so i haven't released anything at all for seasoned and it takes it i've learned that it takes a lot of time to start a clothing line a real clothing line 
So the process is a long time. Like, I would say it takes six to 12 months to have a line completely together that's like good to go, ready. So I'm trying to think, where, where should I begin? Where, what, what do you want? Where do you want to begin with season? Yeah, in I mean, terms of um, products and all that. Yeah, uh, well, like I guess whatever. What? Well, yeah, whatever you're willing to share. Okay. I mean, I'll, like, well, I'll open book with it. Yeah, just yeah. You know. So I'll just go with like how you create a custom product. All right. All right. So first thing you got to do is you obviously got to have a logo. So I had to hire a brand designer, and he actually starts completely like he's full time working for us on October 30th. So I'm really excited about that, but. Had to have a low created, and then that's basically ten thousand dollars for like a complete like brand recognition, everything that you could possibly want for it, all the sizes of logos, variations. I'm all, I've already put like I'm putting ten thousand dollars into it, and like that's before anything's even happened. So you gotta have the logo and like the ideas and stuff. Then you have to find a development place, sort of. So th- I found Stitch Texas Development and Production. And when I, when I was doing Neller, I always, like, in the back of my mind, thought that I needed to find a place like that. And so many people, like, want to start their clothing line, they don't know where to start. That's where you got to start. you got to find a development and production place. So I went to Stitch Texas, emailed them and stuff. I actually learned that from my fashion teacher. So I always talk crap about school, but school is the reason that I was able to start Seasoned. Because I, went to, I, I took a fashion design class as kind of a joke. I liked fashion, but I wasn't passionate about it kind of yet. And then I walked in the class, you know, I was like, whoa, this is kind of cool. And then I stayed after the class the first day or second day, and I talked to her about starting a clothing line, and she's like, oh. And then she gave me, like, this big old paper of possible places I could go to, and she's like, this is a really good place. So I called them, and they were the first place that ever gave me hope for, like, to start a product because, you know, it's kind of – you're looking into, like, a black hole whenever you start a company. You're like, I don't, you don't know where to begin. Right. It's so hard. So I was like, I got to start with the product because that's – that's what will set you apart, sort of. Those companies, they had a good aesthetic that I bought from on Instagram. They had the crappy shirts. They had a good aesthetic. They looked good. But yeah, they roped you in. Yeah. They roped you in, but they didn't They didn't create a customer that's going to come back for more. Right. And that's what I want to do with Season. I want to create something where you're like, oh, shoot, here's a Season launch coming. Like, I'm ready to have my new favorite shirt. Like, yeah. it's going to get better each launch. So that was the main goal with starting it, was to create a product that stands out, that's like, this is high quality, like, really good material you're like you, you go up to your friends like hey feel this you know mm-hmm. like, this is really good yeah so that was the main goal of it was to create a, a company that can create a good relationship with the customer not just one and then you're like done with them i want to have like a really good relationship with the customer so i went to austin texas like a couple days ago and created a, a kind of like a prototype sort of okay you like so you actually sit in the room with them and you go like you bring them like you're a fabrics and stuff that you like like clothes that you really like so if i like this shirt i'd bring her that shirt but i really like the way this feels yeah and then let's yeah, mimic that yeah like, make this and then like you put your own like variation on it so i, I brought in shirts that i really liked but i was like this is what i wish was better about them and this is what i want to change like there's so many options it's like something i'm i learned so much that day i was like there's way more options than i thought there was it yeah. changed stuff so they really opened my eyes on that and i brought in all that stuff you know i got all the ideas for prototypes made and all the fabrics. And so now it's like, it's going to take four to six weeks for prototypes and that to come in. And then if I don't like it, another four to six weeks. (laughs) Yeah. You got to start over kind of. And then like each prototype. So like each shirt, each hoodie, each sweat pant, each like, even if you had like something small, like a short or something, it's like 600 to a thousand dollars per like item just to have one of them fully custom made for a prototype. And I'm like, I'm just blown away at how much that costs. <laughs> yeah. I, it's wor- it's going to be worth it in the end, but like there's, that's really a lot of companies I don't think make it is that beginning process. Like yeah. it takes so much, like, I, don't, I don't, just don't know how people like have, you know, like a Nike or something. I don't know how they create lines and stuff consistently. I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, Nike and yeah, they were, they're a lot old company and things were a lot cheaper back then. But <laughs> I, I got a lot more respect for the fashion industry since I, industry since I began this because like it, since it takes like six months of lead time to create a product like you're creating summer products in the winter and the mm-hmm. fall like I don't understand how I have to understand but I don't understand it right now how like they can be so far ahead of the time and create like 
right. great clothes. Yeah. As soon as you it's put crazy. out one line, you got to start thinking about the next one, I yeah, guess. Yeah. That's why I noticed, like, whenever I watch, like, YouTube and stuff, they have, like, their company and stuff, they're like, yeah, I'm working on 2021 launch. I'm like, I'm still, I'm trying to figure out this. Yeah. Right now. Like, yeah. So, four or six weeks, you get a prototype, you like it. Mm-hmm. What happens from there? So, then, then you have to decide whether you want to go overseas or U.S. produced. So, you go overseas... It costs a lot less. Right. You you say domestic, you get that close relationship with the producer, the manufacturer. You get to actually go to the place and meet them and see what they have in there and stuff like that, how they do things and stuff like that. You can be closer with them. It costs a lot more, though. So if you go overseas, you have to pick someone you trust that you don't even know on the Internet, <laughs> have a one conversation with them and hope that they can pull through so you get like a sample made from them. The reason for the prototypes is they create something called a tech pack and it has basically it's like whenever you get a table from ikea and you have the instructions for it okay you send them the instructions for the shirt yeah and they're they're in they're 100 percent responsible for buying everything for okay. you like you don't tell them like hey i want you to go to this site they have to get it themselves yeah so they gotta do that that's overseas if you domestic, you have to buy it yourself, but then you guarantee quality. You know exactly what you're getting, what you're sending to them. So if you have like a button up shirt, you send them the buttons, the strings, the, everything that you can possibly give them. And you know exactly what you're going to get. But overseas, you get that price. That's way better. Yeah. That's so that's a dilemma that I'm faced with right now is whether I want to go domestic or overseas for the launch. That's that's like something that. I don't have to worry about it until like, I confirm the prototype. So I'm, yeah. not, I'm not stressing about it right now, but that's something in about six weeks. I'm going to really have to make a decision on that. Because, I mean, that, that ultimately sets your price point. Yeah. So uh, the price I gave her about that, she said, you know, it's going to be hard to do that domestically. So I might have to go overseas. And, so I want to give the people the best price. Yeah. I want to create a good product. Like, I don't want like, well, Especially initially. Like yeah. you want to you wanna build that relationship, like you said. You don't want to scare people away yeah. from the from the start. I don't. And uh, actually, the first launch, I don't know if you noticed, I, I'm pretty much giving. I'm saying fifty percent of profit, but basically means I'm, I'm gonna give away all the. I'm not gonna make any profit from the first launch. Basically, just I'm giving away all the profit to Alzheimer's and dementia research for mental health stuff. So that's something like I was really. Where did that passion come from? For Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah. So my granddad has dementia, and like. It's like the impact of like growing up, like when you're younger, you know, they can like remember everything you're mm-hmm. like that. And like when you, when you get older, you finally understand that, you know, they're not superheroes. They're going to eventually. Yeah. Well, you watch, gonna, you watch someone's demise and that, that yeah. messes you up. Yeah, like, it definitely affects you. Yeah, my granddad, like he was like, probably like, he loved the heck out of me. Like he was, a, he's still alive, but like he, he loved me like a lot. But, like it was hard. Like these last few years, cause he finally started, like it started coming on harder. Like you're in a conversation with him talking about like school. Like thirty seconds into it, he's asked the same question. Like, yeah, it's terrible. Like, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah, so that that's my main passion. Like, I'm obviously gonna go to other organizations and research funds, but like that's the main one is just like kind of in tribute to him and like hopefully like so it doesn't happen anymore. Like, I, obviously I can't give like millions of dollars to it right now, but I'm gonna give as much as I can from the first launch. My initial thought is like, how do you how do you initially s- sustain that? Like, give like the funding it, process. Just like, just, like you, you're throwing all this money mm-hmm. at starting this. That's kind of like the show. I feel like a lot of the companies you see on Instagram and stuff, they're they're for, in it for the money, sort of. You know, they they never show any type of like heart or like company family feel. I want to actually like show everything, like expose everything I do in the company. Sort yeah. of like that's what I'm doing with the um documentary series on um. The season YouTube is called Forecast, so like Forecast Weather Seasons. Kind of goes together like that. That's why I'm doing a complete behind the scenes. Like everybody's going to know exactly what went into it, the money into it, the reason the prices are what they are. Yeah. And like that's the first, I feel like not many companies do that. They're like, they kind of keep it stowed away a little bit. Mm-hmm. I want to bring that 100% transparent feel to a company. I mean, props to you. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm a selfish individual, but like, I my, I guess my thought process behind it is like I uh, I'm not I'm not shutting you down by any means but mm-hmm. like I almost want you to like recoup your your investment first before you start like giving money away, you know? Yeah, it's like that's the thing when I started Neller I wanted money. Yeah. When I I'm doing this, I 
I mean, obviously you're gonna you gotta be profitable to sustain the business yeah. but i think of it as like i feel like whatever you give to the world it will come back to you and that's something like my my dad always taught me you, know, you just gotta give as much as you like can and it'll it will either come back to you or it'll come back to you in some sort of way yeah the universe like i'm, I'm big i used to be like not a big like mental guy but like i'm really like huge of like you know you gotta speak into existence mm -hmm. stuff like that like right now you know i might not make the most amount of money but i'm gonna make an impact i'm gonna make a good product and then the money will follow whatever you set your intentions with. you know the secret What's you ever the watched the secret no there's a movie called the secret and it, it's uh it's about the uh the power of oh crap um basically like you talk things out and it, uh, they come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm big on, uh, have you read the four agreements? Uh, I've heard about it, but I've great, not. Great mindset. That changed the law of attraction. Law that's of attraction? A, that's okay, what yeah. I'm looking for. I, I've heard law of attraction. I yeah, love, that's I love what, that. There's this crazy movie called The Secret, and it's about the law of attraction and how it, it started a long time ago, millions of years ago, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, uh, a guy I went to high school with and have interviewed before, Tyler Kane, uh, mm -hmm. was a big, big on it and still is. Um, but you know, I'm, uh, I come from a very blue collar family, you know, yeah. you, you, and I mean, you, you get it too. You're not, you were never going to become a, a great pitcher with sitting on the couch, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and you, you can talk it all, you can talk it up as much as you want to, but, uh, without putting in the work, it, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. Like. And a lot of that uh, staying motivated to put in the work is is mental and is speaking that into existence. And you know, I, I think it's a, the more that I've explored it and the more that I've uh, explored making content and, and uh, you know, meeting new people and, and just it's yeah. it's it's a combination of, of those things. You know, you got to yeah. and, and you get it, too. You got to you got to be in the right headspace to be able to create and to be able to, to work and, and put in the effort. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you are gonna get stuck on the couch and Definitely. and watching YouTube all day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I do love watching YouTube. That, this is like the um, the first thing in my life that I actually feel like I've I'm going to put them all into, and I also have like I've never put this many hours into something that I have this. Like I put a lot of hours into baseball. Obviously, you know I did it for that many years, but this I'm gonna put more hours into because I've never been like this dead set on something. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like I, I think I tweeted about it the other day. I was like, you know, my whole life I've been saying I'm gonna do this, and then I never followed through. You know, I said I was gonna make it in baseball. Never kind of finished it. So I just finally feel like I'm I'm su I'm a success right now, and it hasn't even started because I finally put like my all into something, and I finally like did something that I will be proud of. Yeah. I, I was, I'm not, I'm not honestly proud of my baseball career because I just never felt like I finally just jumped in. I always had like half my foot in the other half out. This is the first thing where I will like broadcast it on social media. If I fail, I fail. And, but you're going to see me go as hard as I can until I fail. Well, to give you a word of encouragement and it's, it's something that I I've learned myself. So, like I said, I moved to Denver and I, I ended up losing my job after like five months oh, really? and, uh, stayed there for basically another month and, and got super depressed myself. You know, didn't have any friends. I had a couple of friends, but they had their own lives and, uh, they were pursuing other, other things. And really, you know, the more that I look back on it, I did not, I didn't have anything to live for. You know, I didn't have a passion. I didn't have, I wasn't pursuing anything. Yeah. And uh, so I moved home, moved in with my parents here in Ruston, mm -hmm. went to work for my dad, doing road construction, and that's what I'm still doing right now. Um, you said something about um, quitting and leaving, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I'm there? definitely, um, so actually today, what is today, October yeah. 17th. This is the last day you um, No, 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 oh. not the last day, but I, uh, I bought a house here like a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and basically like two or three months ago, I was just like, I'm not happy here. I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. Um, I, I guess whenever I moved back here, mm -hmm. I was I was given some inheritance that I did not know about. Oh, really? And I, like I said, I had fallen in love with vlogging. So I bought a camera and a new computer, and I wanted to start vlogging. Okay. And it's kind of hard to vlog in Ruston whenever you're not like not pursuing much. other it's, other things. Do you know Justice Six? 
Oh yeah. 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 Uh, he, he made it in wrestling somehow. I don't know. Well, but that he what, has. Where, he has. What's his like background? He has yeah. another outlet. Like he has. He has a passion. Like as he's not just like he's not just a college student mm-hmm. in Ruston roaming around. You know, he is. He's. He's in. He's a car guy, mm-hmm. and he's able to. He could make it wherever he was because he's focusing all of his efforts under his cars and the vehicles that he's pursuing. Uh, yeah, Gavin Simon. Um, he has close to half a million subscribers on YouTube. Uh, he's from Lake Charles. From what I can tell, from what I've gathered, I've watched a lot of his stuff, and he didn't come from much. Um, and you know, uh, sounds like you have a, a good family. Your parents still together, that whole deal, me too. Um, obviously, not everyone that we know is, is that fortunate. And it sounds like that was maybe his case. And, you know, I, I see, you see it from Casey Neistat. You see it from other people that are, like, super successful. Like, they were kind of dealt a bad hand, and they, they had to make themselves into mm-hmm. something. And I think that kind of, like, you tore your UCL for a reason, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, you you – you went through this whole baseball process for a reason. Like that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is like, I went to Denver, Colorado and I failed and I came home because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so my senior year of high school was the first time that I picked up a camera really and started creating. I took a video editing class and fell in love with it. Um, as soon as I graduated high school, I came here to Louisiana tech and partied my butt off for four years and joined a fraternity. Yeah. Had a great time, made a ton of friends, still love those dudes to this day. But I bought a GoPro. That yeah. was that was about it. You know, love I don't know if you've tried to create with the GoPro, but it's not the most it's versatile a, thing. You know, yeah. you can uh it can do a lot, but it definitely has its drawbacks. It's, yeah, it definitely has its limitations as well. So I pretty much just stopped creating at all you know, I, I was just uh, looking for the next hangout looking for the next party looking for the next uh, thing to do to kill time and, and have a good time and so whenever I got back whenever I left Denver and moved back to Ruston live with my parents I started looking around and was like all right one of my really good friends is a professional motocross racer. Yeah. I love action sports. Like that is, yeah. that's what I've, I've always been attracted to that since, you know, freaking Tony Hawk did the 900 and X games is just so popular and all that stuff. So I started following him around mm-hmm. filming motocross and that kind of ended, um, due to the, you know, the season or whatever it started raining all the time. And, mm-hmm. and, that's whenever I started to think about the, uh, the podcast. So, um, now I have a reason to live, you know, I have something that, that is keeping me going. And, um, yeah, so today, um, I basically got a closing date on my house. Um, I am planning on selling basically all of my possessions. Uh, I've had this desire to, do the whole van life thing and live out of a van for a while. I've been a uh, super wanderlust for years and years and always, you know, you, you grow up here in Louisiana and you, you see just the flatness and the nothingness that it holds sometimes. Yeah. And then you go to places like Colorado and I, you know, I climbed mountains and, and saw that there is this whole other world out there. And I've always been attracted to like Pacific Northwest and California. And I just want to, I just know that there's so many things else out there, and I just want to see the world. Um, a lot that we haven't even come close to seeing. It's yeah. Crazy. So, um, but you know, the the closer that I get to that, I realize that I'm about to enter a season of life where I'm throwing away my income, and I don't have a thousand subscribers on YouTube, so I don't have any foreseeable income necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm gonna started next month I'm, I'm gonna put out a video saying what i'm doing and and you know hey um you know i'm and i wanted to talk to you about this too you know uh i, I love video i love photography and i want to collaborate with people and uh but i'm gonna live out of the back of my truck and sleep on my friend's couches 
That's and dope. Uh, like you know, through this whole process of of starting the podcast and just life, you know, you meet people and people spread out. Mm-hmm. And so I started thinking about it. And I was like, I literally know people coast to coast. And I know people in California. I know people in North Carolina, New York City, Montana. Like, I know people all over the place. And these are all places that I've never been to, never experienced, never gotten to see the culture. And, you know, that, that was another thing with the podcast is, and I guess just like modern culture, being a white dude, mm-hmm. you know, you get put in that white privilege yeah. thing. And, and I've, I just feel I'm so beyond that. Yeah. You know, I want to, I have such a desire to see other people's perspectives on life and, and, uh, learn new cultures and, and just l- learn new things. Yeah. I was never a big school guy. Uh, I can feel that, the, yeah. the day that I graduated college, I was pissed because I had to go to work the next day. Like I did not smile in my graduation photos. That, that's like, <laughs> I got a lot to say about what you just said. I, 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 I liked it all. That's something that I really like. You see all these people in college that are like, they think just cause they get that diploma that they're about to, or that paper that they're about to, you know, have a bunch of money coming in. They're mm-hmm. finally going to be doing like maybe what they love or they're finally going to have some type of income. And all, the, all the, that's going to happen is honestly, a lot of people are just going to be sad. Yeah. And like I've always thought about it like this, you know, you can party for four years and then, you know, work the rest of your life or you can work hard for four years and then party the rest of your life. Sort of. So that's like what my goal is, is like, I want to work as hard as I can on season and then I can, you know, have fun the rest of my life because I built something. I got a foundation going. Then I can finally live that life of like, you know, changing stuff. Then another thing I like that um, you said is uh, going all in like that. That's that's something the universe listens to, man. It's like if it sees like I'm going all in on something, it's going to like accommodate to you. And once people on the internet, especially that story of like, you know, I'm giving up everything. I'm starting a whole new life. I'm you know, forget all the possessions. I'm just going. Yeah. That's that's like that's something people are gonna grab onto and they're be like, I'm, I'm follow this. That's like, oh, what's that guy that's walking across the world or something? Or walking uh, across the, what's oh, his yeah. name? Oh uh, yeah, the, the yeah, DJ or whatever. Snake, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I forget what his name is, but, but yeah, I, did, I know like, who you're talking you know, about. Fir- Mike Poser. Yeah. Mike Posner. The first, um, you know, the first month people were just like, oh no, he ain't going to do it. And then <laughs> they're going to be like, with you. like the first month they'll be like, mm, he's going to fail in like a month. He's going to go back to his old life. And then finally they're going to start sticking in with it. Like, oh, he's really going to do it. Yeah. That's what, that's what, you know, the universe will listen to. That, it's going to give you a bad first two months. That's, that's what it's supposed to do is like, if your first YouTube video got a million views, you wouldn't appreciate it. Yeah. If you have a crappy month, year crappy like launch with clothes you're like and you quit the universe knows all oh, he wasn't really all about it yeah so if you do that and then like obviously like it doesn't work out at first and you keep pushing it's gonna work out like i guess that that was a question that i had earlier and i guess i should pose it now like are you still in school i'm not gonna be in school after this quarter so okay i've been in and out a couple of times i've, I've dropped out i think twice now i uh, dropped out and then i came back here to tech and then i dropped out again to try to go back into baseball and then that's when the summer job happened and after this quarter, I'm only taking two classes anyway right now. I'm pretty much done with it until season legitimately cannot go anymore. That's kind of how it is because school has – school's a waste of money at this point for me because they don't, you don't need a, a – Yeah, a, that was – like you, you said – and I see you were putting all this content out and then you're yeah. like, yeah, I'm a kinesiology major. And I was like, mm. bro, and then you're talking about $10,000 and all this stuff. Like, man, you got to go all in. That, that's but, all. And that's what you're doing, I guess. Yeah, that's – that's why I talk to my parents about it. I'm like, you know, a lot of kids, you know, it's an investment to go to college. You invest in it, and then you see the payback from getting the job. And, you know, over time you pay it back, or if your parents are scholarships, you know. It's an investment, but I would rather, like, if I had to, like, talk to my parents about investing. Investing in, like, college, there will be no payback for me at this point. Yeah. Especially now, like, a kinesiology major, all you can do is go get a physical trainer job. I already have a physical training certification that was, like, $250. Like, you don't need to spend... <laughs> thousands and thousands on top of each other just so you can like say my son's in school he's working towards something in reality nobody's or not nobody but a lot of people in college are kind of like they don't know what they're about to do for sure i was that way <laughs> it's, it's not fun you know yeah. i went through like you know some personality crisis like i don't it's hard to look at a paper and say this is what i want to be no i mean so my story is i have an older brother he's seven years older than me mm-hmm. and he is the kind of dude who made a 32 in his ACT, but also had like an incredible personality, like not a nerd at all. Yeah. And I always wanted to be like him. And so he came to tech. 
I came to tech. He joined Sigma Nu. I joined Sigma Nu. He was a marketing major. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it was over. And I was like, all right, well, uh, I've worked road construction for the past four summers. I'm going to go into the heavy equipment industry. Yeah. And I worked at JPS Equipment Rental in West Monroe mm-hmm. um, just because I knew heavy equipment. And yeah. uh, and I ended up taking a kind of a heavy equipment job in Denver as well, selling industrial forklift batteries. So like what you went to college for, you'd never used or you already you haven't used, or is that kind of in there? Do you yeah. like actually like market it or is that how it works? You I know, know, I mean, I think, uh, yeah. again, it's like, I, I feel I'm confident in the fact that like I had to go through that to get to where I am now. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think if I had found Gary Vanderchuk like six years ago and you know, yeah. he was like, you're not working hard enough, you know, get off your butt and go do what you want to do and go all in on it and pursue it. I think, you know, that would have kind of kicked me into, Hey, I can literally learn anything and everything that I want to sitting on my butt in my living room, staring at my computer. Uh, I can, I can pay a hundred dollars a year to take master classes all day long. And, you know, you know, there's just so many things that you have the whole internet, at your disposal for completely free are like a little course that yeah. is a tenth of a college, just one college class. It's yeah. like, why would you not do that? I mean, if you want to be a lawyer, a doctor, right. you know, stuff like that that needs certification. Please go to school you, yeah. if you want to be a doctor. <laughs> well, like, I don't know. I don't see the point in a lot of stuff. And then the working hard thing, that's something that I think is another thing I finally figured out is I've, I've never worked hard at – like I worked hard at baseball, but yeah. like I, I don't feel like I ever put twenty four seven into it. Well, I think you may have the same issue that I have, and that like, whenever you do physical things, like you're able to get into that zone. Yeah, and you're able to zone out, and check out from the world. Stuff. But then, like all this stuff is is you got to think about it, and you got to think about like what's what's my next step, or what what did I do wrong last time, and like yeah. that's a that's a a drain on a whole other level you know you do a two mile run and you're drained but like you get that runner's high or whatever yeah. and, and you feel good about yourself because you did something but if you if you get this this prototype back and it sucks like you're going to be disappointed yeah. and you're going to have to get back on the horse and and that's try what, it all that's over what again. i like about right now is it's all kind of new to me so i'm learning a lot so it's, it's really fun right now but in a few months it's going to tell if i can keep the intensity that's, for sure that's definitely what same I, here man yeah I it's, mean. Like, <laughs> it's, it's fun when it's new to you but it's like a relationship you know the first few months you know it's everything's new you're like yeah. everything's perfect and then you finally like oh, well i'm used to it kind of now and then you gotta learn how to keep the intensity going yeah you. keep it new keep it fresh yeah. and, and keep it exciting that's uh, that's what i got you gotta learn how to do yeah i don't know, I don't know. hopefully so you're 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 documenting this whole process and yeah. trying to just tell the story of seasoned. Yeah, that's and a, that's I guess how does how does the podcast work into that? Is that something that you're just kind of using it as like a networking opportunity uh, or yeah, a networking opportunity? Then um, Gary V preaches content, and that's yeah. another way for a person to connect with it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's an easy way to. It's not like I'm going out there to get like a whole complex video made it's just like put a camera up for about an hour and a half or less than that and yeah post it it's yeah pretty, it's an easy way to get content out and reach out to people it's like you know i like having conversations so it's fun and i have a partner that does it with me my roommate that yeah who's that guy uh pablo cologne he went to high school with pablo me. cologne his name's i think pablito or it's actually pablo and people call he doesn't look like a pablo no <laughs> He's something else, man. But he, the reason I have him is he's a good conversation guy. Like, I'm an all right conversation guy, but he just, like, talks about random stuff. So, like, whenever I don't know something, he's, like, he comes in with it. So, it's pretty cool to have a partner to do it with. Yeah. Well, and that was that was why I was hesitant, like, initially about us doing this mm-hmm. is because I didn't know what we were going to talk about. But then, obviously, I, I, like, did a little more research on yeah. you and, and found that there's a bunch of stuff we could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh how you only had you've only posted one pod one season podcast looks mm-hmm. like you you did another one here recently uh, or something i have four to upload so I four got in the works yeah or how do you yeah. how do you choose your guest that's a question i always get so uh so my first three guests are all alexandria made so they're they're from my hometown and they're just like from different high schools 
but they started uh, they all have like some type of social media thing they're following so like uh kelvin franklin is the first guy i did he's a he's like a youtuber like streamer type guy he does like football gameplays and lifestyle stuff and he just hit a thousand subscribers so i was like you know i like what he's doing he obviously like he uploads almost every day so he's like he shows I got, I got to have somebody who's showing that they're working at something. I'm not going to bring on somebody, you know, that has I, I watched a couple of his videos, like, of him uh, playing video yeah. games and stuff. The man was cracking He's me up. he got some energy. He definitely he, brings energy into it. He was just, like, he was playing some baseball game, and he was, like, the title is, like, How to Hit Home Runs. Yeah. <laughs> and he just yeah, kept failing on it, and it was just hilarious. Yeah, like, whenever he came into the room for that podcast, you could feel, like, he was passionate about what he was doing. He was talking about it. And, like, you can tell when somebody's real – it was like he was really like passionate about what he was doing and he wanted it bad. So I was like, I like this. This is good energy. But the second guy I got coming on, his name's Ajalon Alexander. He's like a videographer type guy. He does a lot of music videos for rappers. He's he's like small but not small kind of. He has like twenty two hundred subscribers on YouTube. So he has like kind of a following, but like he put puts out good stuff. He just doesn't hasn't hit that like takeoff point yet. So I brought him on there. He gets posted tomorrow. And then I brought on some guy named King Carmouche. That's his rapper name. But he's like, he's a rapper. He has a Netflix. He's a Netflix movie that he stars in. Wow. I think he was made in Alexandria. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. He was like, I don't think he was like the main role, but he was one of like a top role. He was like in a lot of scenes. Uh, I did one with him and he, that comes out on the 21st. I think that's Monday. And then uh, those are the two that I have planned right now for sure that are coming So you're trying to put out... Trying to put out one a week. One a week? Mm -hmm. Probably like every Friday. Okay. That's kind of the goal, but I got to yeah, put out Monday. That's my goal too. It's, it's kind of hard. Like, you know, these first three I got done, I literally did those in two days. Just like, I hit them all. I said, I'm going to be in home this weekend. I'm, I'm coming to see y'all. And yeah. did all three in one weekend. That was a hard weekend. So you knew all three of these guys previously? Mm -hmm. I didn't know King Carmouche that well and Ajalon. That was the first time I ever met him. Gotcha. So that was... It was fun having a conversation with them. I didn't know. I made sure I didn't know much about them. And I wanted to create the conversation from scratch. Yeah. And they tell me about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, it was kind of awkward whenever I walked in and we're like setting up. Yeah. It's because like, I, like, yeah, I want it to be stuff. real. Like, you know, and yeah. I, I uh, and that's, that has bit me in the butt a couple times. Uh, but like I said, I, I found you to be a super interesting dude and, and you have, you had, you had a, you have a cool story like leading up to where you're at now and, and you're obviously, I am same thing with like Asia. Like she's, she's doing something. She's trying to do something. She's trying to put out some serious mm -hmm. stuff and, 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 uh, you know, improve people's lives and change things. And, and you're, you're working towards that same goal. So that's definitely, uh, I have, uh, Asia is going to be on the season podcast. I think we talked about it. We just got to figure out a time and date and stuff. You know, she, she's a lot busier than me. I, I'm busy, but like, I'm not the type of busy where, I don't know. It's, it's, there's two different type of busies, you know. This is like work that is um, like brought on by myself, sort of. I don't like have a schedule. I just know that I'm gonna work for a certain amount of hours every day on this. Yeah. You know, she has actual classes. And all that. So <laughs> yeah. It's hard. It's hard to schedule around classes and stuff. Yeah, no doubt. That's and that's kind of uh, so I put out basically like 32 podcasts, one a week mm -hmm. for 32 weeks. Is that it? is that you put out one a week for 32? Yeah. Last 32 weeks? Yeah, yeah, like. Um, that you know, I started January first, and the goal was to put out fifty two this year, and I like skipped a week, and then I made up for it by putting out one on Monday and then one on Friday, and then skipped a week and uh, just like, like I had a dude lined up, and like thirty minutes before he was like, "Hey, dude, I gotta go to the dentist," and I was just like. All yeah, right, bro. Uh, I'm probably not gonna hit you up again because that was irresponsible. And yeah, I mean, that's why I felt bad about you because we were so. Yeah, dude, that was a totally was, different you know, situation. You know? <laughs> but yeah, that was like I know I was like, dang, I'm, I'm finally starting to have like this professional feel, and then ten minutes before I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta, do <laughs> gotta it. take like, care of your friends, yeah. dude. Uh, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to create is like be a man of my word. That's something I never have been, sort of. Fair enough. Oh yeah, we did. I think my battery died. <laughs> All right. Uh, classic Dan Mabry project. <laughs> cutting off in the middle of the podcast. Does uh, that happen before? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. Especially when I was shooting with ADD and it cuts off at 30 yeah. minutes. Like, man, that was such an aggravating thing. Um, yeah. I don't know. We kind of kind of killed the mood. But I forgot what we were talking about. Uh, it's only been like a minute. Oh. Yeah. I guess, do you have any questions for me? Trying to think of a good one. Uh, 
Did you get any questions from uh, Instagram? Um, you know, I'm going to shout out the two people because, you know, people just don't, they don't like to put their self out there and ask questions. Oh, okay. Sometimes. We were talking about, uh, we were talking about Asia. I know that. Uh-huh. And, uh, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it. Uh, Asia like grew up almost like very literally in my backyard. Oh, really? Um, and I just, that girl, I love gassing her up. Like I mm-hmm. love hyping her up because like she's such a hype person to she, begin she's with. She's a high energy person. Yeah. And, uh, and she's got a lot of goals and she is like, just like full sprint chasing them hard as she can. And, uh, I just, I love it. I love her. I love yeah. what her spirit. And that's uh, what I told her on when I, I went to, uh, I met her one time for like, we talked about like a goal, not a goal thing, but like a video thing that she wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I was like, you know, I talk a lot on social media and stuff. I say what I'm going to do. And then I kind of like, I do it, but I don't do like everything that I said I was. She says like as little as she can. And she does way more than that. Like she posts way more about what she's already done and what she's doing than what she's going to do. She yeah. ne- I never hear her say like, I'm going to do this. And then it doesn't happen. She right. Says, I just did this. I'm like, that's kind of cool. That's, I, I like talking about what's about to happen and then kind of for, you know. Yeah. I'm bad about that too. Like. The, it's, fun, it's fun to hype people up, sort of. I well, I, talking about like the podcasts, like coming to a halt, kind of like basically October was not my month. Like I hit up like three different people to do podcasts and all of them, I say it denied. They didn't really like say no, but like they, they always had scheduling conflicts or that kind of deal. And, um, you know, I, people have their own lives and that are, respect that and you know some of the people that i'm trying to get have families and businesses and you know they have other other obligations so um i by no means am i expecting them to come talk to me Mm -hmm. some kid that has 180 subscribers on youtube like i'm Mm -hmm. I'm a nobody and i'm just grateful that anybody would sit down and talk to me um that's one of the hard process of um starting to season stuff is like you know you gotta like make people believe sort of they don't have anything to latch on to sort of at first you know that first launch if it does bad they still have nothing to latch on to so that's that's something i'm trying to be is like whenever you feel me in the room you're gonna feel my energy and my passion that's gonna make you kind of want to be with the brand so yeah that's what i want to bring out there for sure and another thing is uh we've been like like you took like reach out to people for podcasts so we've been reaching out for people um to help with season like promoters and stuff Mm -hmm. we don't want to give them like compensation like money wise and stuff we just like and we'll give them some products or something. But right. We basically want people to give in to like the brand identity and the reason for it with the mental health and stuff. And that's an easy thing right now to kind of latch onto in terms of like finding promoters, a lot of people who care about mental health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you got a good way to pitch it to them for sure. I definitely, that's something that I didn't have with Neller and with probably 95 at times. I didn't have like that mission statement where like, this is what it is. Mm-hmm. This is how, you know, I plan to do something other than for myself. Yeah, for sure. That's Go it. ahead and shout out your people. Okay. I got two. I got, I got one. It was Cole Campbell. He's he's probably like he's uh he I'm about, I'm going to see him after this. He's on uh, from Rustin goes to tech. He's uh he's probably my biggest supporter in terms of, like he like every time he comes over here, he's like, dude, when, when's it launched? I'm ready to buy it. Like I got my mom ready to buy it for you. <laughs> I got the credit card ready. I'm like, man, I'm I'm trying. I'm you know, I like how his energy for it. It's really fun to have people who like your product and ready for it no doubt and then their guy named chase he, he went to my high school chase futural he asked hey so what kind of stuff do you have in the works for fashion wise that's uh that's a pretty easy i got i got a pretty good idea with that uh you know uh streetwear and stuff like uh yeah. bro that, 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 that's why i literally wore this shirt because i i didn't know if you were familiar with uh, the grateful dead or bootleg grateful dead t-shirts because there's like there's a gigantic market for that right now. That's uh people creating their own art, like when, using the when I was Grateful Dead symbols and stuff. Probably like my first 17 years on this earth, I was like that typical like the way you think about like I, I was like you know I wasn't like a loser in high school. I was like I was pretty cool, not like you know I'm not I wasn't a, I wasn't a popular guy, but I wasn't a, I wasn't a stupid nerd. Yeah, not a nerd, but you know you know what I mean. Not that. <laughs> You're good. And, uh, I was like, I was kind of like. A, a cool guy, but I also had that weird side to me, sort of. Like, I was into, like, certain type of music that nobody, like, Hollywood Undead, I was listening okay. to. Like, everybody okay, was listening I listened to, like, to the yeah. first album. Yeah. You know, I was listening to them, but I also listened to the other stuff that everybody listened to. And 
I would also like, I was into like that type of stuff and certain type of clothes that nobody else was into. So I felt like I was weird kind of, Yeah. I never had anybody cause in Pineville, Louisiana, you don't have much variance. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing for sure. So you always felt like, I always felt like cause I was different and stuff like there wasn't really, I was just kind of weird. But that's, that was something I really liked. It was like, there's a streetwear market and I like the clothes I like. There's a bunch of people who like it too. And I didn't know that until probably maybe a year ago. Like in college, I got made fun of for wearing like tight jeans and then like, you know, the shirts that are like different, like yeah, long shirts. For sure. So it was, I would just walk into like the baseball locker room and they'd be like, nice jeans. Like <laughs> you got them for your girlfriend or something. I'm like, I bought them myself. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I love, there's a kid named Dylan Day. Um, uh, mm-hmm. He's actually a professional football player. Uh, I think he's still in the league. But anyway, Dylan is a, was a, went to Mississippi State as a center, and uh, it's a gigantic individual. And his senior year of high school uh, was the song "Jerk." You're a jerk. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You're a jerk. Yeah, so like those dudes, cool those dudes were wearing skinny jeans and and. Uh, one day Dylan showed up to school wearing the tightest jeans I ever seen. They were maroon, and he, he was wearing a. Uh, that was definitely back in the day before it even was close to. A yeah, trend. yeah, yeah, and he was wearing these like customized Nike boxing boots. Like they're literally like you wore them in the boxing ring, wow. and people made fun of this dude so bad. But he's such a big dude and such a cool dude yeah, that like so confident in something you can make anything like. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And like, that was the first time that I like really realized like this dude is so confident in himself, like it, probably somewhat due to his athletic ability and, and you know, the opportunities that he's going to have after high school. But like still like I wasn't going to wear skinny jeans to school. Like I was still wearing my boot cut yeah. Jeans from Abercrombie or whatever. It was basically yeah. a different fashion in Louisiana than, well, especially when you go around the country, you're gonna yeah you're gonna see a lot. Well, I mean, more. even even like whenever I was in college to after college, like I wore Wranglers every day mm-hmm. in college, but I was also trying to fit in with my fraternity and you know that kind of yeah. deal. I was just trying to, I guess I I mean I I enjoyed that stuff, but I didn't necessarily I wasn't conscious about it i guess like it was just kind of the thing to do and so i was comfortable in that stuff um and now i'm I'm comfortable in this stuff you know Mm -hmm. i don't wear (laughs) if i tell people i was in a fraternity like they'd be like you're a liar you know which i didn't have long hair and all that kind of stuff i definitely see that that was um that's something i've always liked about myself is um I've never, like, I feel like I've never worn something because somebody else wears it. Like, even, like, my girlfriend's family is, like, really, like, I wouldn't call them country, but they're definitely not, like, my type of people in that sense. <laughs> Fair and enough. like, even, like, they're in family meetings and stuff. Like, she says, you know, don't wear your tightest jeans, but I really don't care. I wear my tightest jeans. <laughs> I don't do it on purpose to make her mad, but, you know, I wear my I wear my normal clothes like, yeah. no matter who I'm around. Yeah, you're not going to change for anybody. And everybody, like, there's a lot of people who think I'm gay or something just because I'm wearing tight jeans mm-hmm. and, like, you know, those shirts and all that stuff, but, and care about myself and get my eyebrows done. And you know, the, it's kind of girly, but tan. Yeah. uh, Dude, the first video I clicked on on your YouTube is like, the first thing you say is like, uh, I look a little red because I stayed in the tan bed too long. And I was just like, who is this kid? Like, come on, man. Especially like dudes from Louisiana. Like those country dudes are like, you tan, you get your eyebrows done, you get your toes done, even your hands sometimes. Yeah. You um, you have like this weird, you know, flippy hair. You wear the tightest <laughs> jeans you can. You you gotta be gay. Yeah. I'm like, oh no. No. Oh, no, I'm, I'm pretty cool. Pretty you know, attracted to women. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I guess you're just attracted to me, man. I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's how it is. it's it's weird though sometimes. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I don't know. So I guess what do you have planned? What are you? You got hoodies and and. T-shirts and not 100% dead set on anything. Honestly, these are all prototypes. But I got sweatpant hoodie, a long sleeve T-shirt, and uh, some I call a torso wear shirt. It's a three eighth shirt instead of like you know three quarter sleeve baseball shirt or a one fourth sleeve. It's a three eighth that like cuts like right above the elbow. That's like okay. that's the thing I've always wanted to create was that type of shirt because I'm I don't like those shirts that stop right here and then like it kind of comes up a, i don't know I, I just i'm a weird about my clothes and the way they fit yeah. on me so i wanted to create that type but it would of be shirt. like a tighter sleeve it, like kinda. A mo- it depends on the person who's wearing it like you know yeah. a person who's like more of the that streetwear person like in los angeles that skates a lot and they're super like skinny like it's going to be a little bit of an oversized look on them but then a person who lifts 
it's gonna look a little bit tired on them so it yeah. just depends on the person so yeah that's fair. Gonna, it's gonna have that variance too it's not a uh, athletic apparel it's more of a that lifestyle feel clothing that's just it's gonna be really good more of the streetwear more streetwear aspect love streetwear yeah and it's it's popping yeah, that's why um my fashion class i've learned a lot about fashion that's all yes you know, this is that's the one class that i'm proud of taking the rest of them i wish i never took it was a waste of money <laughs> that fashion class is probably like the one that you would think would be the most waste but it's the one that's the only reason that this is happening yeah i didn't know that i had like this big of a passion for fashion that, that rhymes pretty well but yeah you know, everything works. happens for a reason yeah, man i'm telling you man that i'm glad i took that fashion class it's a little weird i'm the only dude in there there's one other dude but he's uh he might be into dudes too i don't know he's a little metro he, he's a, he's different than me i'm the, <laughs> I'm the only dude in there Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But yeah, that's cool. Well, I guess let's wrap it up there. Mm-hmm. Um, tell the people where to find you. On Instagram, it's Connor Miller seventeen thirty eight. Twi- I need to get all my handles the same. On Twitter, it's Con Mill with three L's, one in on the con. Uh, <laughs> YouTube, it's Connor Miller, just the full name with an O instead of an E. A lot of people spell it with an, uh, an E. I don't understand. I do understand it. My parents kind of messed up with that, <laughs> put an O in there instead. But it's whatever. Uh, SZND shop for at SZND shop for all the Instagram and Twitter handles for seasoned then seasoned on YouTube. I think that's it. Yeah. Where'd the 1738 come from? Betty Wap, baby. <laughs> okay. All right. That's, I, I feel, I'm a little embarrassed now. Like, cause like they asked me for like a business email and I, I want to give them the seasoned email, but it's not like fully functional yet. So I'd say Connor Miller, 1738. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell they immediately write me off kind of as a business guy. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun talking. I, it felt cool to not be on my own podcast for once. Yeah, it for sure. Experience. Yeah, I was I was hoping that uh you you, you, you should be on the other, other should be on the season podcast. I'm down, man. After um I've only I say after you I say after your experience on the road and all that. Yeah. When you come make your way back through here. For sure. And then we can talk about that. That'd be yeah. a cool experience. Well and um, you know, maybe we can collaborate in, in some point between now and then. So I'm definitely down for that. That'd be fun. All right. Cool. Well, appreciate you coming on and um, seriously look forward to uh, what you have going on in the future, man. Appreciate it. For sure.